Are you asking yourself, how the heck did we get into this situation? Well, it's been an insidious, creeping crawl to get here. And the problem is, you were so distracted first by speed, you know? Have you ever noticed like most jobs are really fast paced, stressful? Like who has time to think, right? Let alone ask questions. So I think it started there. And then of course, it's just been progressing ever since. But thankfully, we're starting to wake up. I've often wondered when I tell a story, where to start? <laughs> it seems like the stories that I live are so complex, you know? There's a lot of depth and layers and complexity to the consciousness that I be. I think that's why I'm drawn to things like, I don't know, cards, art. Because that's really all cards are for me. They're just art. Whether it's, you know, Louise Hay Power Thoughts or my own cards or whether they're tarot or oracle, or whether they're scriptural cards, like it doesn't matter to me. I know God will talk to me through anything, <laughs> you know, but it's up to me how much am I willing to receive of God. When I was out riding my bike this morning, I was realizing that somewhere, I know since childhood, so you know what, teenagehood up, <laughs> that I stopped having fun more and more because my desire to want to be with others um, didn't really allow me to be fully me, you know? People weren't interested in all the things that I was interested in, so I did what they wanted to do. And in doing that, I gave up the things that I enjoy doing. My activities are very childlike, and some would say childish. I still like doing gymnastics and yoga. I've been doing that since I was 11. <laughs> I love running. I've been doing that since I was nine and a half. I love walking barefoot. I've been doing that my whole life. <laughs> Up until I, you know, became an adult, moved to the city and realized I had to wear shoes. Because, you know, people don't accept you if you don't wear shoes. <laughs> they have these, they have all these fears about, you know, them going barefoot. <laughs> I guess it helps them to justify why they choose to wear shoes, right? Aren't you afraid you're going to walk on glass? Uh, well, the road's in front of me, and I don't know where you look when you're walking, but I'm looking at whoever it is that I'm chatting with, and I'm looking all around, and I'm looking on the ground in front of me for obstacles. I mean, I walk in the woods barefoot, so I have to watch for things like rocks and stumps and you know, branches or roots or something that are going to trip me. So, you know, I do the same thing when I'm out on the road. Whether it's a slick of, you know, somebody's green bin that's been spilt all over the road, or whether it's broken glass or, you know, whatever. I'm acutely aware of my environment, so why aren't you? But, you know, okay, so I'll come into your world. You know, everybody's world is a rabbit hole. So, I know my rabbit hole. I'll come into yours if you don't want to come into mine. <laughs> And then I find that people are so rigid in their rabbit holes, and then I don't want to be there in their rabbit hole anymore. <laughs> because, you know, why would I let go of all the fun that I'm having in mind to go into somebody else's that, like, there's so much restriction and so many rules and regulations and justifications? <laughs> I like people. I enjoy spending time with people. But I realize being with one person thinking that one person is going to be everything in your life, whether it's your biological parents, your siblings, a best friend, a, some other family, it, whether it's a job, a career, like, I don't know, what is it for you? <laughs> I keep asking that for me, what is it for me? <laughs> well, it's always been love and family, I guess. A sense of family, right? because that's where my greatest joy was when I was younger, it was in my family. And then things started to change in my family and I didn't, nobody explain the changes to me. You know, I was supposed to learn all that myself. I was supposed to find the answers myself. I have no answers. <laughs> Even now, I have no answers. All I have is awareness that people live their lives wearing tightly fitted shoes and not examining their environment around them, starting with them, their own thoughts, their body, and then go outward and w what is this interaction I'm having with nature, with people? And then people say, you know, I got entity attachments. 
you figure. Do you know why you have entity attachments? <laughs> it's because you have a lot of things to hide. <laughs> so you invite them in. <laughs> they got to make you paranoid, right? They have to make you paranoid because, well, you're scared and you don't want to trust. So the entities do that job. But you think they're evil now. <laughs> they're not evil. You invited them in. You created them. You used them as a tool of protection so that you could continue to feel fearful. I don't know. What are you afraid of? <laughs> Who and what? <laughs> I used to be afraid of darkness, like literal darkness. Because the only thing I could see in total darkness were these little specks of light. And I kept saying, where do these little specks of light come from? When the lights are all turned out, my eyes are closed, and I can see the darkness, but I can still see these little specks of light. Like, what is up with that? Where do they come from? Who and what are these little specks of light? And what would happen if I focused on the light instead of the dark? God, I remember thinking this when I was holding on to my little teddy bear. I must have only been, what, six when I got him, so maybe six, seven years old. <laughs> oh my God, I think too much. I do. It's true. <laughs> I totally understand why my sister called me Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, you because know, Winnie the Pooh is just always there thinking, right? Think, 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 because it was a fun thing to do. <laughs> but I, I'm this physical body and it wants to have fun too. And so I like to do and move and do all sorts of physical activities. I like to work and play and rest. And in that process of creating a balance between those three things, I find myself having fun. <laughs> Right? So I want to share the cards that I pulled today. And I want to talk about them in relation to what it is that I'm sharing. Uh, the first one is desires. Physical di desires and secret passions will be fulfilled. Physical desires. Well, what are my physical, who and what are my physical desires? <laughs> you know, people look at that and they just think, oh, it's a good message, so I'm going to cling to that. And But you don't stop to, to ask questions, <laughs> right? <clears throat> you got to ask questions when a message comes to you. Even the Bible says, you know, ask questions. If, if the spirit comes to you, ask questions. This is the spirit. It's a message. It's a spirit. It's an angel. It's a message. That's what an angel means. It means a message. Well, ask it questions and see what comes up from you. What is physical desire for me in this body? Is it sexual? Is it like food related? I just wanna, right? For me, I think it's hiking and biking, literally movement, physical movement. I enjoy that. Whether it's, you know, I've been sitting for a while, so I go run to the balcony or while I walk quick or slow, it doesn't matter. I walk to the balcony and maybe go walk up and down stairs or maybe I'll go outside for a walk to the garden or I'll walk to the back of the building. I need to expend physical energy because that's a desire. Not a for me. Well, I don't know, am I even this? I don't know who and what I am. I know that I receive thoughts and something's thinking <laughs> and I'm aware that something is thinking and I'm aware that it's making calculations and choices and decisions <laughs> that have led to like all of this and you know today it's like well somebody's got a physical desire for cards and for music and for arts and crafts and for sewing and I don't know it looks like like how much clothing do we really need and compared to like how many parts are we playing in our life? You know, how many costumes versus how many actual clothes do we need? I look at my closet and I've got bins up there full of more clothes that need to be altered. You know, when this wardrobe is done, I've got a whole backup wardrobe. Well, who and what needs all that? Who and what desire, physical desire, needs that? And like, who and what physical desire for spending time in this little room as opposed to getting out there and being and doing 
moving. Who what does that belong to? Because it seems like I, there's two, there's two of me. <laughs> but apparently there's me, myself, and I, so there's three of me. <laughs> secret passions, well, they're secret, wow. I don't even know what, what they are then. If they're secret, like, well, maybe I do. How secret are they? Am I hiding them from myself as well as you? Am I just hiding them from you? I don't know. Am I aware of these secret passions? Because, you know, the, the key word is fulfillment, right? But, well, if I'm not aware of the physical desires and who and what all those physical desires belong to, and if I'm not aware who and what these secret passions are and who and what these secret passions belong to, how can I possibly expect fulfillment? Like, it's like the tail on the donkey. <laughs> or they spin you around and you gotta find the, you know, pinata. <laughs> what energy, space, and consciousness have I been creating my life from? Is it this, you know, blind trying to hit the pinata after I've been spun around and I have no clue where I am? I just know I'm here. <laughs> I'm always here. But, you know, what direction am I facing? Or am I, do I even stop to think about what direction I'm facing? Or am I so focused on the fact that I've got to find the pinata and hit it because somebody's telling me I have to participate in this game and... I've decided, well, okay, like, you know, everybody else is, so why not? And I'll just be like the sheep that you all are. <laughs> and you look like me, so we must all be sheep. <laughs> and then I'm like, I don't even know if I like this game. <laughs> I don't know. It's who and what desire is does this pinata game belong to? <laughs> this blindfolded spin me around and I'm just like Wait a second, what, whoa, 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 what? First of all, why am I agreeing to be blindfolded? Why am I agreeing to be spun around? Why am I agreeing to hit something with a baton or a baston to break something open so I can get some reward? That's fucking life, people. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like winning the lottery, the luck of the draw if you actually strike it and you get to crack it open and you know then you can take off the blindfold and savor the sweets of some crazy effort to some crazy game that you the only reason why you're playing is because everybody else is so you might want to think about that one because it sure got me scratching my head today well, what follows that? What is the fulfillment? Well, apparently it's wealth. Like, how freaking awesome is that, right? You will receive a payment which could amount to a considerable sum of money. <sighs> like, seriously? Who doesn't want more of that, right? Considerable sum of money. So we all think about, coming back to desires, where we spend that money we don't stop and ask every day well, where do I spend my life force energy where am I putting my attention what is my intention of this attention well who and what does this intention and attention belong to because if I think it's me and I'm just whimsically letting anything catch my attention and I have no real intentions, except for maybe to be happy. <laughs> well, there, that was a moment. I was happy in that moment. Well, what about this one? What am I depending on to <laughs> get me smiling the next time around? <laughs> right? So, What am I investing my life force energy into? What have I been investing my life force energy into? A lot of work. A lot of 
not so well reciprocated work. Uh, partly because I've struggled with being able to convey messages, to take the message and put it into a clear, concise, artistic form that is both attention-grabbing and also that draws you in, not to me, <laughs> to you and you. And you and you and you, right? I don't need you to get lost in my world. I, I need you to get lost in yours. I need you to wake up to yours, really. Because I'm trying to wake up to mine. And I know I'm not the identical reflection of anyone on this planet, nor are you. <laughs> Even twins, there's slight differences, right? Even in like literal what do they call them, identical twins? There can be differences, <laughs> major differences. Even, even if you don't see it energetically, and how do I know this? Because I've done energy work on twins and it was very eye-opening. And did I do energy work? Oh, well, I facilitated a session, that's all I can say. Because I don't know who or what did the energy work. It might have been me, but I don't know for sure. Because I still don't know who and what me is. Or I. <laughs> or myself. <laughs> a payment that amounts to a considerable sum of money. A payment. that can amount to a considerable sum of money. Does that mean I'm going to receive money, which is a considerable amount of money? Or am I going to receive some sort of reward payment, which then I do something with, I don't know, maybe act out my desires? to which then, well, it looks like I'm fulfilled and it looks like I have a considerable sum of money. And what would I do with that wealth? Well, I got two cards. Or actually what I asked was, what would be the result of that wealth in my life? <laughs> and the first thing I got was, well, loss. You will suffer the loss of something very dear to you. Cherish what you still have. You will suffer the loss. Why? I can choose something different. I can experience loss without suffering. So what if I chose that instead of suffering? What if I chose to say, you know, if I have 150 pounds I need to lose, and I lose it, that I have to suffer when I reap my reward of it? I don't know, doesn't that sound a little contradictory, right? Like why would I choose to lose 150 pounds if I thought that the final reward would be suffering? <laughs> Does that make sense to you to do that? So how about I drop the suffering? <laughs> how about I choose something different? How about I say, ooh, God wants me to let go of this inhibition or let go of that desire. And I just sit there and say, okay, I'll do it. And, and then just wait, you know, with my palms up <laughs> or my arms open wide, ready to receive. Because nature abhors a vacuum, right? Nature abhors an empty space. It needs to fill it. Do you really think it's coincidental that when you start taking things away from your home that there's a party that wants to put something in that because you're so used to seeing and having something and being something there. <laughs> so, you know, you suffer when you see this empty space and you have to fill it again. You choose to fill it again. But what if, like what I'm trying to do, you just sit back and say, you know what? I want to have a really fun life and I'm willing to receive 
your will, God, for me. Whatever that is. And not feel like I have to name it or label it or dictate it or, in, you know, the only intention is just to receive. <laughs> you know, not I want to receive it because I have the intention of da 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 like most people be, do, and have when they're creating a life. This is an awesome message. Cherish what you still have. <clears throat> How about just cherish what you have? Because if you cherish what you still have, there's always an underlying fear. Well, we still have it, but we could lose it. And if we lose it, because we're so attached to it, we might suffer. And then, you know, messages came in twos today. So the next message was wild revelry. Shed your inhibitions. Shed your inhibitions to celebrate a joyous time. <laughs> Isn't it crazy to think that people are afraid to have fun, <laughs> to be childlike again, to be completely uninhibited and open? Most people live for today, but not like this, not in wild revelry. Most people live for today to just <laughs> suck everything from everything and everyone that they can because they think that there's not enough for everyone and they have to take it from others. <laughs> Maybe they even think that they're not deserving because, well, they know they're not because they've beguiled themselves into thinking that somebody is trying to take shit away from them. And so they're suffering. And that's why they, that's why I guess they can't shed their fear because they're suffering, right? They're focused on the loss, and they can't celebrate a joyous time. <laughs> oh my God, can I, where do I even begin with all the loss in my life? <sighs> and each time it was an experiment in where can I find the joy in this loss? <laughs> You know, so I started looking for the silver lining. But you know, I'm a very self-competitive person with me, myself, and I. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what, guys and girls? I think I got everything covered. Um, I think something else is possible here. It's noisy, isn't it? It's just noise. It's just noise. Are you getting irritated by it? Are you getting irritated by the background noise? Oh dear. Oh, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Now you can hear me, right? I think what I discovered this morning when I was out on my bike ride and when I stopped to appreciate the flowers that a group of children planted under the supervision of adults, obviously, although they're, they don't seem to be very, they seem a little neglected, the flowers. I wonder if the kids are kind of neglected too, right? I don't know. It's a reflection of it, isn't it? I don't know. Or maybe it's just a reflection of, it's just a project and we don't really take the sincerity of the project to our heart, you know? It's just summer camp. Well, it's just a project. Let's just get the kids to do this for a season and it doesn't matter if the plants die. The kids are gonna have fun, right? What about teaching those kids how to come back, you know, once a week and take care of that garden that they planted? How about incorporating that into the summer camp instead of just focusing on, you know, the highlights like just giving them a hit of acid and a hit of LSD and then a hit of heroin and then a hit of fen fentanyl, and, right? Because that's what it's setting them up for. So how about you can't bring them back? And, and, you know, like God said to Adam, tend to the garden. <laughs> you know, let them, let them connect. 
because I saw a group of kids today when I was out barefoot bike riding and barefoot everything, even though I had my flip-flops, and the kids said, you're barefoot, and I said, yes, I am, and they're like, oh my God, <laughs> because they've lost already because they live in a city with fearful parents and a fearful community, they've lost that connection to their, to their own innate nature. There's this belief that when you live in the city, you have to wear shoes. That's what I was told. Isn't that what you're told? I think Australians would say otherwise. And for a moment today, for a very brief moment, I did consider Maybe I can move to Australia. But I'm not one to run away. I did yoga today because I saw a woman hunkered down in the shade next to the woods that, you know, lined the creek that was running through the property. You know, kind of hidden away. She didn't want anyone to see her doing yoga. And I was like, I'm gonna go out and find the biggest clearing that I can. <laughs> and I'm gonna do yoga so everyone can see me. Why? <clears throat> Why, is it because I need attention? No, it's because I need to be an example. <laughs> Somebody has to be the example. That's why I go barefoot, in the woods and in the city. That's why I do yoga in the parks. Because if I cannot show the embodiment of a healthy mind, body, and spirit as my life, well, first of all, I have no right talking about anything. And secondly, I should just probably keep all that to myself. And maybe look for people that are willing to show me something different if that's truly what my heart desires. Today I lived for today because I was in each of those moments. And I remember when I was contemplating, you know, what was the routine, what was the choreography of the routine that I created as a child because, you know, I got introduced to gymnastics and I also got introduced to yoga at the same time because gymnastics is really just a series of yoga asanas and I got introduced to choreography. Like I had to do it all. Nobody gave me instructions, just do it. You're a kid. You have imagination. Go do it. You ask an adult to do that today and pff, they got to go research it. They don't go inward. They go outward to research. Well, what is everybody else doing? How's everybody else doing? I don't want to be different. You know, I want to be accepted. So I better do like what everybody else is doing. Well, then you're, you're living in, in your fears. You're living an inhibited life. You're not living in wild revelry, so you must not be in joy. You might be faking it. You know, you might still be in that faking it till you're making it, thinking, oh my God, what age am I now? And I'm still faking it? Like, what the flying monkeys? So I, I was wondering, while I was feeling, letting my body do this gymnastic, yoga type activity today. I was like, you know, how did we come up with a routine? What was the routine? And how did we think and feel while we were creating that routine? And, and what did we think and feel upon the completion of that routine? And I don't remember. I just remember I love gymnastics. And once I realized that it was just an asana with some movement to the next asana, I was like, well then, what are these asanas? And that's how I got drawn into yoga, to the asanas, the practice of being in the pose and saying, well, what is, who and what is this body in this pose? And what is this pain and where is this pain originating from? Like, is it just physical? Is it mental? Is it emotional? Usually I could feel an emotion. I could feel an emotion of fear or sadness. And I'm like, oh, so that's what you are. So 
in that hip right now, you're a lot of fear, you're a lot of stress because maybe I got it's close to the end of the year and I wasn't a very good student because I don't learn that way. And I got stressed out because it was exam time, right? You gotta make sure you pass. <laughs> you get better than a C. In public school, I barely got a C. I just barely skid by. It wasn't until I got into high school and college and university that I really began to excel. I'm not sure why that was. Maybe because to some degree, there's a leeway of, you're gonna go out into the workforce and you can learn everything that you need to learn, but there's still going to be things that you're just gonna to have to in the moment be and do and have and show up as. And no amount of formal education is ever going to prepare you for that, ever. No amount of education will ever prepare you to give birth. <laughs> Do you know how many books I read before I gave birth? Would you like to hear my birth story? No, you don't, trust me. Let's just say I sprained my husband's thumb in the process. I tried to get off the table and go home. I can't tell you how many times. I called the nurses and the, whoever else was around me every foul possible name imaginable. It's like I became this whole other beastie person. And it's like, there's no thank you, I'm, I'm not doing this. And then I realized, <laughs> you don't have a choice <laughs> because that was your choice. <laughs> and your body is ready, so mind and emotions, you better get on board. And no matter yoga asanas, and no matter, no amount of Meditation or yoga practice and study is ever going to teach you for that either. So there's just some things that you can't learn, that you just have to experience, and the experience itself humbles you to the point where you are that little child again, and you just receive, and in the process of receiving, you learn something about yourself. So, what happens if, because I know there's a lot of fear. Why? Because the reason why there's no wild revelry is because there's too many inhibitions and inhibitions are just fear. So what happens if you shed your inhibitions to celebrate a joyous time? Well, this is the word that came up, right? Catastrophe. That's the only thing that fear understands. So if there's any talk about the need to shed your fear or to shed your inhibitions, you don't do it because you know that if you do that, it's going to end up in a catastrophe. You have to be fearful. You have to be paranoid. You have to invite in all this darkness and then accuse it or someone else for it, right? For being in your presence. You don't take even accountability for that. So it makes sense that if you live in that kind of energy that a catastrophe is going to happen because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And yet, <laughs> beware a drastic turn of events and brace to weather a coming storm. Well, I rode my bike in the storm today. <laughs> and I was like a, a mad little three-year-old, absolutely delighting in the chaos of the rain and the wind against my skin. I got rained on. <laughs> and my heart just pumping because I'm just pedaling as hard as I can to get home before, you know, I get caught in the storm. And I suspect there's a whole lot more coming. And I thought, but what if I don't do that? 
I'm about hmm, maybe 10 minutes from home so even if I get poured on it's okay it's kind of fun actually <laughs> what if I just stop and put my phone away and take my time and just let my body be totally soaked by the rain what if I received it this storm <laughs> this is brace you know what brace is it's like to put up defenses and walls and yet what I did was I embraced, I opened to receive it. And then as a result, <laughs> you know, I shed my inhibitions, right? And I was in the energy of joy. I was able to celebrate the moment. It was a very long moment. I don't know, like 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> it was delightful. And so I thought, well, what is a drastic turn of events? I mean, is it a drastic turn of events if you wake up one morning and you're 100 pounds less? Like you didn't have to go to the gym or anything. And I mean, you wake up and you're in perfect health. And I mean, is that drastic? Is it something to be afraid of? Or, you know, is a drastic turn of events like you lose, right? Coming back to this. It's all about suffering. It's about loss and suffering. And it's not to say that you don't go through a process of grieving. <laughs> That's part of the process of moving from loss to a sense of I'm the same person, but I'll never be the same because of this experience. Not so much just the loss, but the whole experience of the loss. That's what really changes us. So I don't know what you think and feel about storms. I've always loved storms. Whether I'm on the water in the storm, whether I'm walking in the storm, or I'm in a canoe in the storm, or I'm riding my bike in the storm, there is something to be absolutely in awe and reverie when it comes to storms. And storms can be a lot of times of your own making. You must be pretty frickin' powerful if you can create a catastrophe in your own life. <laughs> so the other side to that, of course, is this card came up because, you know, cards came up in two today. <laughs> luck, good fortune will shine upon you. Be careful not to push your luck. Luck, good fortune will shine upon you. It's kind of like being the sunflower in the garden and it's a beautiful day, you know, there's not a cloud in the sky and you just, you just savor the warmth of the sun and you follow the light, right? Because you're just like glowing in the afterglow, right? A fortune. Be careful not to push your luck. Well, yeah, I guess even, even the sunflower knows enough not to bend so far down that it breaks its own stem as the sun is setting, right? We all have to know that, oh, okay, there is a boundary there for me. It's not a boundary of my choosing, but the universe is kind of saying, mm, that's it for today, right? You know, this is for your own well-being. You know, maybe sunflowers have a different capacity with their stems. 
but like all of us, you know, this has been a pattern for a long time. You know, the sun rises, the sun sets, the sun rises, the sun sets, the sun rises, the sun sets. It's been a pattern for a long time. And so over time, sunflowers have, you know, well, we can thicken through the core. You know, we don't have to bend so much. We can be more, we can just kind of let the, the flower, the top part of ourselves, this is like the tree in yoga, by the way. You can let the top part just sort of wave in the wind, right? Most people just do tree like this, but you know, think about nature, the storm, right? Where are you in relation to the storms as a tree, as a body, right? As a mind, as an emotion. Like, do you just go and do tree pose or do you stop and think about, I don't know, do teachers even teach this? Are they even aware of this? I don't know. I know I am because I've lived a life of yoga my whole life <laughs> and yoga is all about going inward just like any spiritual or godly practice is all about going inward be still and know that I am <laughs> okay well who and what am I in a storm versus just like anybody can just be a tree like anybody can be a tree even a person in a wheelchair can be a tree. Even somebody with no legs can be a tree, as long as you got arms. And you don't even have to have arms because, you know, phantom limbs, right? You can imagine they're there. Anybody can be a tree. What kind of tree are you, though, in a storm, right? <sighs> do you lose a limb? Yeah. Do you, like, completely uproot because you're so rigid? You know, catastrophe is one hand or one side of a story that we live based on how we perceive and receive and deceive ourselves to believing that life is a certain way. And, you know, this, the opposite of this, luck, good fortune, well, it's the result of recognizing that there is always a calm and there is always a storm and sometimes one precedes the other and one follows the other. So in a time of calm, right, life is good for most people. And in the time of just think 2020 to, to now, right, when there's a storm and has the storm stopped? No. And how do we know that? Because look at nature. Nature is just simply reflecting all the storms that humanity is undergoing as a consciousness, as emotions, as physical bodies. It's being reflected in nature and in each other. So the storm's not over. <laughs> so if you think the shit show is over, I'm sorry, but it's not. <laughs> I still have a couple more years, maybe a few more years. <sighs> and then we can all get to work. I mean, really get to work and do the work to rebuild ourselves because we're still in the process of being torn down. We're still in the process of having to come face to face with ourselves. And doesn't mean that all people will. This is just an opportunity. That's what storms are. They're just opportunities <laughs> for you to receive. Coming back to wealth, for you to receive a payment, some awareness. That's your payment, some awareness of yourself, to which then you go out in the world, and that can lead to a considerable amount of money because this world works on money. Whatever the currency is, digital, paper, I don't give a sh what it is. It's been around. Money in all its forms has been around since, I don't know. I don't know. But it's been around a long time. And, you know, all these archaeologists who keep pulling things up out of the ground, it just keeps revealing to us, yeah, it's been there, it's been there. So we've been doing this cycle for how long? And we still haven't woke the flying monkeys up. That's why I will not say 
that I am aware. I'm waking up. Am I? I don't know. <laughs> I think I am. I want to believe I am. And you know what they say, you believe it long enough, hard enough, strong enough, and you'll see it. So good fortune will shine upon you. Just be careful not to push your luck. Don't push your fortune. Yes. Don't, who and what are you trying to push your fortune onto? Right? This is where we become controlling and, you know, this worked for me and so you have to do this because, you know, it worked for me so it's going to work for you. That might not always be the case. In fact, probably not. Right? That's why for me, when I started the Intuitive Body Foodie Network, well, it started as the Vegan Vegetarian Foodie Network, I guess, to start with. And then I changed my diet, and I thought, well, you know, and there's a whole lot more God coming in, or spirit. And I thought, well, I better include that, because, you know, I don't, don't want to take all the credit, and don't, I don't want to take all the praise. You know, because God says all the glory belongs to me. So it's like, okay, well, then I'll just call myself the Intuitive Body. I'm the receiver of all these messages. And food is not just something I put in my mouth, it's everything. And so, you know, yeah, I will be very careful not to push my fortune and, and tell people that because I eat 85% fermented foods that you should too. No, I would not say that. I'm, I've never said that on this channel. <laughs> now, there have been people in that have come to me and asked me certain things either in private on my email or on as comments in the comment section, they've asked me about very specific things because I think part of them kind of knew that I was an intuitive or, you know, maybe part of them is intuitive, but they're still having a hard time receiving that intuitiveness from other people because, you know, they're starting to see the God within, but they don't really see the God in others yet. They're not really in the namaste, right? They want to be, but they're not really embodying it yet. But at least they're putting in the effort. And so something, you know, spirit's like, okay, just give them the message. They'll note it. They may not be ready to receive it just yet and to be it and have it and to know it and to embody it. But they, they, can, they can note it. I've done that my whole life. I note everything, you know. Note, vibration, sound. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. Note it. And so I would get this intuitive information. And as the facilitator or the hand of God, right, because I'm just spirits animating me spirits give me all the information and i'm just i'm the one with the lips you know like i said if only you could talk to god like this <laughs> but that doesn't work in that world in that reality so it's like you listen you listen to the silence and to all the noise and instead of focusing on the judgment of the noise maker of that noise you just receive the noise and you receive all the silence. Boy, silence is really loud in case you haven't yet got there. It's freaking really loud. And you listen. And then, you know, thy will be done through this body. What do I need to be, do, have, know, receive, and perceive? Set me on my course. I might be blindfolded now. I might be the two of swords. I'm ready, right? I'm a little bit defensive, but... Any moment I can be like this and take the blindfold off and off I go. And in that process, actually, of being blindfolded and sitting still, because this is kind of like a boundary, right? I'm in stillness in case you can't see, because I can't see you, but I can hear you. She's not wearing earplugs in the Two of Swords, right? She can hear everything including what's going on inside her body and her thoughts. That's why she's akin to the justice card. But she's got a boundary there, right in front of the heart, right? Because people come in through the heart. They want to <laughs> suck your life force energy. It's like, no, I am being still and I am receiving. I'm in a process of steadfast receiving. I can get up at any moment. I don't need to see. I have the skill of these swords to fight. 
at any moment, and all I need to do is to hear you. Did you guys ever see the movies, or the, the um, what do you call it? There was a series called uh, C, I think it was, where they were all blind, yeah. And they were fighters because they listened. This is that energy of the Two of Swords, right? You're just listening, you know how to fight, but you listen because you're blindfolded. But the beauty is that any moment that can be taken off so that you can see this physical world. But it, 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 your abilities are not dependent on what you see. They're dependent on what you hear and what you feel. Because even in that, you're feeling the vibrations on the ground. Right? If it's something big, if an elephant's coming, you're going to feel it. If it's a, an, an earthquake, you're going to feel it. But see, we all live with the blindfold off and we're so consumed by everything that we see that we forget to feel and we forget to hear. And in that, we push our luck, constantly pushing fortune onto others. You have to be like this. No, you have to be like this. No, you. And that's where the conflict, I think, comes in between us. But, you know, those are just my thoughts. The rest of my thoughts go in my notebook, my journal. And part of that gets portrayed through what I create for you to watch as uplifting, I hope, and pretty scenery, or at least funny sometimes, you know. Anyway, that's it. May I never be so old as to stop being youthful, but I can certainly embrace the aging process without getting old. What do you do to embrace the aging process without getting old?